So, morning everybody. My name is Carl Bjornsson, uh, Business Development Director for Rafnar. Uh, we're an Icelandic company uh, founded in 2005 for the purpose of developing what we call the Urkau Hull, um, which is a name we didn't really think through because every time we break to take it outside of Iceland, it's translated to the OK Hull. But I'd like to convince you that it's, it's better than that. So just uh, sort of an update on what we've done in the past. Uh, last time we were here in 2016 was the first time that we actually presented a boat outside of Iceland. Um, what we did was that we built this 11 meter uh, lifter, 1100 series as we call it, Embla, um, and sailed it from Iceland over to, to Gothenburg to attend the show. Uh, 1,357 nautical miles, did that at an average speed of around 26 knots, and it took some just under 52 hours. Uh, funnily enough, that boat was actually just completed right before we left. Um, didn't give us a lot of time or a lot of testing uh, time to actually check whether everything worked, but luckily it did. We ran into some problems just outside of Norway when we lost one of our engines, but had that fixed within 24 hours and kept going. Uh, but this was sort of marked the first time we showed a, a uh, production ready boat. Uh, before that, we had worked primarily with, um, with uh, our partners in, in Iceland and first customers there. I just wanted to throw this picture in here. When um, after the trip, uh, the guys started going through the pictures that they had on their phones and, uh, and that, and uh, noticed this picture of uh, Commander Sigurdur Auskrimslon from the Icelandic Coast Guard who joined for the journey. Uh, he actually just took uh, some vacation days to go for the journey, thought it would be a fun trip. And then noticed that he's drinking a hot cup of coffee uh, while doing 32 knots through a bit of chop. Uh, but that's, that's what the purpose of this vessel is and our whole list is ultimately reducing the slamming impact. Uh, and then that's the reason for this journey and, and the next journey I'm just about to tell you now. Uh, purpose is to show exactly what the hull is capable of. And that's the value that we bring to the industry. We're here because of the hull and then we design fancy boats to put on top of it. So this is where we're coming from. Um, when we started in 2005, we began our development on the hull itself, uh, which was a long process, took uh, 10 years. In 2015 was the first time we actually built a boat, being uh, this lifter here on, on the left-hand side, uh, on the right-hand side from where you're sitting. Um, what uh, the Icelandic Coast Guard was the sort of first users of the boat and our development partners. So they came in in 2011 when we had a, a uh, hull that was ready to start using properly. And we gave them demos and told them, drive it like you stole it and do your best to destroy it, uh, which they did repeatedly. And then they would come back, uh, give us ergonomic and functional feedback and tell us what needed fixing until they were happy with the boat and happy going out into these situations uh, that they do quite regularly. Um, then we developed the Flinker 850, the eight and a half meter boat uh, that you see on the, on the other side, uh, which has become our other series product, uh, also capable of taking to the waves quite regularly. We, we approached the University of Iceland and asked, can you help us out um, or can you uh, take our boat, take our hull, uh, compare it to uh, other types of hulls and see, see what comes out of it. So they did an independent study uh, to verify what, uh, what we had developed over all this time. It was a long development process and a lot of investment and we needed data to show exactly how well it worked. And this is obviously a um, uh, very uh, general summary of what came out of that, but. On average, what they found when they measured number of impacts over 10 minutes um, at 0.57 G and N1 G using, um, using the whole body vibration standards for lack of a better alter alternative is, uh, was an 82% reduction at 0.57 G at the bow and, and a 1 G reduction 
um, 95 percent reduction at uh, at 1G, uh, which uh, which uh, compared to a deep V hull was quite a, a an astonishing result. Uh, but we we knew this to a degree. We didn't necessarily know the percentages and and how drastic this this would be. Uh, so it took us a little bit of time to uh, be ready to present those percentages, but but uh, those were the results. And in order to demonstrate this, we go on these trips, such as sailing the boat over from Iceland to Sweden, and then doing the trip that we did last uh, weekend, which I'll come into in a little bit. But what, what this means is that the hull provides uh, obviously a larger platform that you can now use. Uh, with limited slamming comes comes a safer platform. That was the ultimate purpose of this, having, having uh, providing a safer platform to work on. And especially for, for our partners back home, the search and rescue teams and the Coast Guard, uh, who need to be out there in, in very rough conditions. Uh, gives them a more comfortable working environment, gives them a larger deck space that they can now work with, um, as, uh, and therefore can use a much smaller vessel uh, it, to do tasks that they otherwise would have only trusted themselves using larger vessels. Uh, because of the stability and, and how stable the craft is, at, is uh, in operation, it is very easy to use, it's easy to train on. Uh, it leaves very minimal wake and therefore causes limited water disturbance, allowing them to take off a bit faster without disrupting, uh, disturbing everything in, their, in the harbor environment. Um, and makes it very agile and, and very maneuverable in, in operations. Because of the particular keel structure that you have, uh, the boat stays extremely firm in the water. And uh, it's a bit of a demonstration of that where he enters a turn at 40 knots and manages to stay at high speed in the turn without any slide and exits roughly around there at about 22 knots. This is them doing it again. Um, show it from the perspective of uh, of the driver. So this is our backdrop back home. Our office is just over there. And then taking on uh, a bit of chop at around 38, 39 knots, but maintaining that bow extremely stable. Now, we needed to do another one of these trips. So last weekend, uh, on Thursday actually, at, at one o'clock, we set off, myself and uh, three others, set off from Reykjavik, well, technically Kopavod, but nobody knows that, so Reykjavik. Um, and did a circumnavigation journey of, of Iceland. Uh, the total trip took roughly 43 hours, nonstop. Well, when I say nonstop, we stopped for 15 to 30 minutes at each place just for, for fuel stops. Other than that, we had a large fuel bladder, you can see up front, uh, for a bit of extra capacity. The boat itself was a eight and a half meter open boat, something that I will not be participating again. Uh, at the Arctic Circle, that becomes a problem. <laughs> so the, the trip was a bit characterized by being very, very cold and very uncomfortable for a very long time. Um, we, it was, uh, we got some tailwind for a lot of the West Coast. Um, and, uh, but when we got down to the South, things got, things got very choppy and very, very uncomfortable for a little while in terms of, not in terms of the slamming, but Basically, because you get, you get um, the boat kept getting filled with waves, um, and uh, run a short video of that. So this is uh, this is the 11 meter uh, Coast Guard boat, and uh, then our eight and a half meter next to it. And this is where we sleep up in the bow. Uh, as I said before, because the boat is quite stable, it's it's quite a nice place to sleep. It was the best place to sleep actually on the boat. Um, and most of the most of the um, images and, and videos, these are all from my phone. Uh, we're still compiling those videos. Uh, so the first 12 hours, the first 
first leg of the trip was the first 12 hours up to a place called Bolingovic in uh, in the West Fjords. And we were all uh, pretty excited about it. We you know were still pumped in the first 12 hours, so I get have a lot of videos from those first 12 hours. And then uh, they gradually reduce the further we go into the trip as I uh, become less amused with what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was a once in a lifetime sort of thing to do. Um, well, on an open boat, I'll, I'm, I'll do it again in, uh, in a cabin boat with a heater and a cup of coffee. That's not a problem, but, uh, but the open boat so arrangement meant that we had to do that, which uh, works, worked out fine, I guess. It was, uh, went into a, drifted off into a different place for a little bit. But w what you do get is a lot of be beautiful scenery. If you, haven't been to, if you haven't been to Iceland and you plan on going, I highly recommend the West Fjords. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful place. Is uh, we stopped off in in Bolingovic in the West Fjords, small town, um, a fishing a fishing village. It was quite uh, felt quite nice to see the Coast Guard um, being there, and then then they were quite uh, it was it was quite uh, good having them around because then they gave us a call regularly on the trip asking how we were doing. At one point, our AS system dropped out, so we uh, so they called us immediately asking if we were okay. It's nice to have, uh, uh, nice to know that they're they're always there watching out. So this is the northernmost tip of Iceland. Up here, you're at you're at a uh, Arctic Circle territory. Uh, that was a 12-hour uh, leg from from the west coast of Iceland over to Grimsey, a small island in the far north of Iceland. It was the longest 12 hours of my life, I think. And just about here on the south coast, we started hitting quite a bit of chop. Um, and while I still felt comfortable filming, I kept my, uh, this is me st standing, uh, standing up and, and filming with my phone. Uh, we had a 360 degree, degree camera there, but conveniently it, it broke halfway through and all the videos, well half of the videos are purple for some reason. But then the further we got, we, we got into ever bigger and bigger waves. And uh, around the southwest tip of Iceland, we were, we were into a sea state, definitely sea state six, in my, in my uh, memory at least, sea state seven. It was, uh, at, at, at that time, it was, it was very comfortable knowing that we had a very good operator who uh, was able to, able to take on those waves quite easily. So I'll leave that there. But we, we, what we thought after this is, right, let's, uh, let's promote this as a thing to do. So if anybody's up for the challenge of, uh, of taking an open, open boat around Iceland and trying to beat a time of operating time of 38 hours, total 43, then uh, take a screenshot and, uh, and give me a call. Or uh, drop me an email, I mean. So projects we've been working on, um, we've been developing um, an, a smaller version, essentially, of our 11-meter craft. So this is an eight and a half cabin version. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll run through these quite quickly. We've also been looking at a larger sister vessel to the to the lifter, uh, having a, lar a wider beam, uh, this being an open craft, but capable of carrying a, a larger cabin, a larger wheelhouse. Um, and this, which, uh, which we are working on in, in conjunction with the uh, Icelandic search and rescue teams, who are now in the progress of, of uh, redeveloping their search and rescue capabilities around the country, um, especially now with all the, the advent of tourism or the influx of tourism in the last few years, their capabilities need to sort of be in line with that. Last but not least, I just wanna give a small uh, introduction to another project we've been working on. Uh, so this is a, a bit of a side project to uh, to Rafnar, but in all those studies that we've done on, on acceleration and wave slamming, and uh, we, we started thinking, is there a solution out there uh, that we could just have on board our boats that would present to us automatically uh, or in real time what acceleration we're feeling and how we should drive, guide our boats based on that. Uh, we, we had trouble finding it, so we decided to develop that ourselves. 
So we call it Heffering Marine, a guided data-driven safety at sea. And what it is is essentially a data gathering solution, where, which records uh, the acceleration being experienced on the boat, uh, compares that to with uh, weather prediction and weather data, and through enough data can provide scenario forecasting for what is likely to occur in the very near future for operators. What sparked this, other than our own research of, of accelerations, uh, was also something that's similar to what's been happening here, um, accidents on rib charters. So with all the tourism influx in Iceland, there have been a number of these rib charter companies that have popped up, and, uh, and with it, a large number of accidents. And authorities are, or agencies are struggling to keep up, and companies are struggling to keep up with their own operators. So we spoke to them, and, and after some discussion of what they might think is a good solution, um, this solution uh, was the result. And we are now working with a large insurance uh, provider in Iceland to equip this on at least 16 different RIP charters in, in Iceland. Uh, that will have this as a solution to uh, sort of provide a safer journey for their passengers and their crew. Some uh, prototypes that we worked on, we're still in the development phase, but this is the current prototype that we have, where, um, where the in its, in its um, very basic form, it provides this red, green, and yellow screen, showing uh, what acceleration you're experiencing and how safe the g onward journey is based on statistically what it's been in the past for both your uh, journey and other journeys with the amassed data. And on top of that, for the charters, uh, a fleet management system. So if you have 11, 12 boats out there, you as the fleet owner can monitor all of them in real time and see the same uh, color that they're seeing and then uh, inform them of such, uh, the fact that they're being monitored. So that's it for me. Thank you very much, and I'm um, open to any questions if you have any. Right. So we've been we've been um, for the prototypes we've been relying on the on the whole body vibration standard as well, but we are going to be using the data that we're amassing to, uh, to do that research as well. So while we use that as the benchmark, um, we thought about for ourselves, for example, having, a, and, and for these uh, test subjects, the, the rib charter companies, of having a way of uh, them informing when they start feeling uncomfortable, uh, which, uh, which in itself is uh, at least a benchmark that they can use when their passengers sitting way up front, which are usually the ones that get injured, uh, start feeling dis uncomfortable, then that will be an indication of at least you're in yellow now. Uh, so, 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 but other than that, we are now using the uh, whole body vibration standard. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so, th uh, the um, whether the um, our hull is is uh, scalable. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, while we now have our eight and a half meter and the eleven meter that. Uh, larger boat that you saw there is a 50 meter, then we have designs for a, uh, a 24 and a 38. Essentially what the research that we still have to do is where the benefits stop, but we know that it's scalable up to a, a certain point that, uh, that is sort of yet to, yet to uh, emerge. <laughs>